loud. That always scares me. <laughs> okay, and then I'm going to, we have about three more minutes till we want to go live on Facebook. Oh, it's um, the planet motion. Two page. Oh, we're failing. It's okay. Here. Ben, what's Jacob's last name? Jacob, right here. Yeah. He's in the waiting room. Oh, man. Okay. Those people show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. T minus one minute. All right. Okay. Hey guys, so I'm gonna, I have to switch computers because for some reason, Zoom is not letting me use my camera. So I'll be on in a couple seconds, okay? Okay, that sounds great, Gabby. Okay, going live. Got it. A little bit of the rainbow wheel action happening. Okay. Uh-huh. Wanna. Okay, I think we can get started. Um Just gonna admit everybody real quick, give everyone like 30 seconds or so to filter in. We have such a jam-packed evening tonight that I wanna get us all going. Um, but, okay, all right. Um, um, hello, relatives. It's so nice to see you. Welcome. My name is Michelle Bowman. I am Dakota. I come from the Wana Tioshbae out in Sistin. Um, and I will be your MC for this evening's Gifts of the Plant Nation program, where we will be focusing on our Unjijintkahu or our rosehip relatives. Um, for those of you who may not know me, um, again, my name is Michela. I worked with Lower Phelan Creek Project for about five years as their communications and cultural programs coordinator. Lower Phelan Creek Project is a native-led environmental and conservation organization here in, in Imanija Ska, um, or St. Paul and the cities here. And they do a lot of work with protecting local Dakota sacred sites like Wakantipi and what's now called Indian Mounds Regional Park, doing a lot of urban um, restoration and conservation of the ecosystems here 
and around our um, plant relatives. So a lot of plant medicine work while also um, highlighting Dakota culture and life ways um, here in our homelands in Miniso de Makoche. Um, I am so excited. Um, I'm so happy and thankful to be here. Um, as a young person, I am trying really hard to learn my language and learn more about our plant relatives and um, webinars like this um, that really came to fruition out of COVID. Um, there's always a silver lining to everything, but I think webinars help us connect to a lot of our elders that we might not have been able to in the past and reach a lot of our community members that are spread out. Tonight, we will be talking about rose hips um, in our program called Gifts of the Plant Nation. And Gifts of the Plant Nation is a program that came to fruition after Lower Phelan Creek Project um, became Native-led in 2019. Previously, Lower Failing Creek Project was more of a traditional white-led um, environmental conservation group. Um, but once the people that were leading those efforts figured out that Wakantipi, the nature sanctuary that we work out of, um, held a lot of uh, significance to Dakota people, there is a shift that happened um, to become native led. And when that happened, a lot of our leadership here noticed that um, agencies like St. Paul Parks and Rec and a lot of the, the government agencies that work closely with the land and the water um, here in our homelands and around our sacred sites, folks that work there had really different relationships to our plant uh, relatives than we do as Dakota people. Um, a few summers ago, um, Lower Phelan Creek Project's executive director, Maggie Lawrence, and I um, were working on some restoration and storytelling um, events that we wanted to do after a few conversations that we had with um, the city about um, cottonwood trees. And um, if you are Dakota or native, you know that cottonwoods have hold a lot of significance to our people as not only um, relatives really important in our ceremony life, but cottonwoods, they they connect us with the Wichach Bioyate or the Star Nation, and they have so many um, medicinal gifts. And to us, those relatives, they, they are that, they're relatives. Um, but to uh, the the city here and you know uh, different land managing agencies they view cottonwoods as junk trees and that was really hurtful um, for us to hear, especially working so closely with our sacred sites, so we decided to launch a program called gifts of the cottonwood tree, um, where we invited. Um, our uh, Dekshi Jim red eagle to come and tell um, some stories about. Um, how and why cottonwoods are so important to us as Dakota people. But we also talked about their medicinal gifts and uses as well as their um, ecological benefits and how they work in the environment. And that program was so well received by a, a number of community folks, um, folks that work in traditional environmental fields, as well as a lot of teachers in our area. So um, we wanted to continue that program. And so we, um, we wrote a grant and we received it. And so now we get to do um, four more programs, just like Gifts of the Cottonwoods. So our Gifts of the Plant Nation program will be a seasonal program um, of webinars. So each season, we are gonna be highlighting a different plant relative and having um, our elders come in and talk about them and tell traditional stories while Lower Phelan Creek Project's team members talk about their medicinal gifts as well as their um, benefits um, to the environment and their ecology. Um, Native people, we've always been environmentalists, we've always been ecologists, so um, hosting programs like this where we can highlight and share our perspectives um, and center them in an environmental field that's typically dominated by um, Western ways of working with plants is super important. 
Um, I feel so blessed to host this event. I think that when we are able to treat plants as our relatives and not resources, we can all figure out how um, to be in this world and be good relatives. Um, so this evening, we have our Dekshi Joseph Marshall III here to um, talk with us about some traditional stories for um, Ujijintkahu or rose hips. And then we will be transitioning from his storytelling to our environmental justice educator and organizer, Rose Whipple, um, who is going to be talking about rose hips and their medicinal um, gifts. And then we're going to be hearing from Lower Phelan Creek Projects and uh, Environmental Stewardship Manager, uh, Gabby Minoman, um, and hear about their ecological role and environmental knowledge. Um, so to begin, I want to introduce Dekshi Joseph Marshall III who is a historian, a writer, a teacher, a craftsman, an administrator, an actor, and a public speaker. Uh, Mr. Marshall was born and raised on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota and is an enrolled member of the Sichangu Oyate, the Rosebud Sioux Lakota tribe. He was a founding board member in 1971 of the Sinteglishka University, the tribal college at the Rosebud Indian Reservation. He has developed nonprofit advocacy groups for Native American students, worked as an educational and health programs administrator for the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, written essays based on Lakota culture and collected stories, including How Not to Catch Fish and Other Adventures of Iktomi. And along the way, he became a craftsman of traditional Lakota bows and arrows. Um, we are so humbled and grateful to have Dekshi uh, uh, Joseph Marshall III with us tonight. And I am going to pass it off to him to tell some stories for us. Oh, oh, am Takiyopi. You want to pitch shoes up, Wolf. Um, it's good to be here. This is uh, <clears throat> certainly not new as as we heard that you know Zoom is 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 now something that's been part of our lives for for at least a couple of years <clears throat> and necessarily so. But you know, as far as the technological aspects of Zoom, I'm I'm not familiar with how to set it up and do it. I can access it. I can get it online <laughs> and, and do that. But I'm glad that you all know how how to do it and what's going on because. It's, it's an important tool for us now because like we are, we're all in different parts of the country. I'm in New Mexico right at the moment where it's probably a little bit warmer than you are up in Minnesota. But this enables us to, to get together like our ancestors used to do in the old days and visit and talk and teach each other and learn from each other. So in that sense, I, you know, in spite of all the, you know, scary things technologically about it, I'm, I'm glad to be, be part of it. I'm glad that Zoom is part of our lives now. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to be on with you all this evening um, and, and talk about rose hips and other things associated with it. Um, I'm sure somebody, somebody will talk more about specifically about rose hips and what to do with them. But there are a couple other things I wanted to talk about before we get to that point, get to those things. And I'm sure that some of you have been into ceremony uh, over the years and, and uh, whether it's a healing ceremony or so forth. And one of the things I was very curious about early on when I was going into ceremony is, is in some some of those ceremonies, we were asked to make 405 prayer ties or tobacco bundles. And you know as well as I do, making tobacco bundles is is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. So, you know, 405 at a time, and you take them into ceremony, and the, and the medicine man puts them around his altar, and so forth. But over the years, I was always, you know, I never really asked why. 
why 405? I mean, I, I in, 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 you know, other than that, there was a lot of tobacco bundles. Uh, I was sort of curious about why 405, but I never really asked why. But over the years, I found out that the reason, one of the reasons is that 405 is a number of relatives that we shared our environment with. All the plants, all the animals, all of those, and us as human beings, as two-legged, all of us comprise that 405 number. So that's one of the reasons, that's what I learned, that the reason we do that is because when we do the 405 tobacco bundles, we're acknowledging with a lot of humility all the other relatives in our environment, in the world that we live in. So, and then, and then the basic prayer that we all say that you are familiar with is mitako yeoyasa, which means all my relatives. And so it's, it's not just human relatives, it's all, every, every living thing. So that's what I learned. So that's, that's in keeping with what you all are doing with learning about plants and so on. So I'm, I'm glad that you all decided to do that. And I think that's, you know, it's important to keep it up uh, no matter how we do it, go about it. And to that end, um, I want to mention a little bit about rose hips. Uh, I probably know more just about as much about it as you do. It's not a very big plant as plants go. Um, it's a berry bush. It's, the fruit is berries. It can be reddish to orange, and, and, and I think some people have said some of them even purple or black, but mostly red, red and orange. Um, and our ancestors, the Lakota and Dakota, used it basically for, for uh, medicine and, and for teas. Um, it was good for treating coughs and, and colds, and, 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 and some people say it even was good for arthritic pain. And I think that's something that, that I would definitely look into now that I'm getting on in my years. Um, but as I said, somebody, somebody will make a, will probably tell you more specifically about, about what rose hips are about. But they're a real pretty plant. They're, they're flat leaf and a real pretty plant. And, and I've heard people talk about saying, once they, once they take the, the hair out of the berries, you know, you have to be careful to do that first. And then you can chew it. Uh, it's it's edible. Uh, I haven't tasted one for a long time, but some people say to use it as a as a, as a uh, like mouthwash to freshen your breath. So so it has a variety of uses, and and uh, if you dry it out, or it, if you dry it out, then you can make a tea out of it. And the tea was was good for for treating coughs and so forth. Uh, you took the whole bud and put it in a, in, a, in a pot of water and let it steep for a while and then you can make some tea out of it. So that's in, in, the, in the short term, that's what the, that's what rose hips are about. And, and, and the Lakota word, and it's probably the same in, in Dakota, the Lakota word is ujijitka. Ujijitka. And uh, it, 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 that means the, the, the red bud itself. Also, you know, as a kid, one of the curiosities that I always had, you know, as a kid, I would ask, I always ask why, you know, why something happened or so forth. But I was always curious about how things started in the beginning. How did it all start? How did something all have its beginning. Who thought about it? Who made it? Who started it? Uh, so since we're talking about food and medicinal plants, I mean medicinal plants, we now know, we have that knowledge and it's been passed down for many, many generations. And that's what we're doing right now is passing on that, that information. And thankfully much of it is written now so we can look it up in, in what form or another. But for many of those generations, as we all are aware, all of our information was passed down orally from, you know, verbally from one generation to the next through the use of stories or just basic information as a teaching tool. And 
So with regard to plants, in, you know, in order to know more, about, know more about it, you have to go out there and do it. You have to go follow grandma or grandpa or mom and dad or whoever and go out to the prairie or wherever and dig up the team seal of the, the, the turnip. We'll go out and, and, and find out where the choke cherry trees were, choke cherry shrubs were, or the buffalo berries. Know, for, first of all, where they are and how to harvest them. So it was a very hands-on process. You had to do it in order to learn it. And that's one of the things that our culture was known for and was, was, was the backbone really of our culture, how all of it was passed down from, from one generation to the next, from the, from the adult to the child. So how was it with, how did our ancestors figure out what food, what plant was useful as a food, what plant was useful as a medicine or both? How did they figure that out? Did some information just magically come from the sky? I don't think so. I don't think so. And, you know, uh, you know whenever, whenever we talk about something like this, we really just have to consider what it took to develop that knowledge in the first place. And I'm not talking about yesterday or the day before or last year or 10 years ago. I'm talking about hundreds and thousands of years ago when our ancestors uh, were first came into this area and were living off the land. Um, and that was well before, you know, our modern conveniences and how we get about now and how we shop and how we procure anything. Um, that's when our ancestors were either walking or riding a horse. So that was a long time ago. So someone at some point, this is what I want you to think about. Someone at some point had to learn which plant was good for food and which was not. Which plant was good for medicine and which was not. And which plant was not good to eat? Some plants are poisonous. So how did we figure that out? How did they figure that all out? And, and you know, um, when you consider that when our ancestors were walking and riding horses, um, there were two sources of food, plants and animals. Of the two, which do you suppose was easier to harvest? Plants. Because plants couldn't run away from you. They couldn't run away from you 20 miles an hour, or they couldn't, you know, burrow back into the ground, or they couldn't charge you if you got them angry, like animals do. All you had to do was know where to find them, know what they're all about, how to harvest them, and when to harvest them. And how did you do? You, you had, you, as I said, you learned that from grandma and grandpa. But in the beginning, I'm always curious about who started. Who figured out which plant was good and which one was bad? And how did that happen? And it, there's only one answer to that. And that's, that's through patience and the task of a trial and error. Simply put, if you thought that this plant was useful in some way, or you, early, you had that basic knowledge that it could be used for something, then how do you figure out what it was good for? Was it good to eat? Was it good to use to weave? Or was it good to use as a medicine? How do you figure that out? You tested it. How do you test it? You, you probably picked a little bit, maybe you picked a leaf or something, or a berry, or a bud or something, and you ate it. You tasted it. And if you didn't react to it, if it didn't give you a rash or or, or you didn't have some other kind of reaction, then, then it was okay. Then you, you went on to whatever the next step was and maybe made a tea out of it or pounded it and dried it and figured out what it was best for. So that's what always fascinated me. It's how that, in, 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 you know, in the beginning, it was basically by, smell, by trial and error, by smelling it for one thing, to see if it had a good old nice scent to it, nice 
and, and by tasting it to see if there were any kind of flavor to it. And by touching it, certainly, you had to touch it in order to, 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 to handle it. And, and eventually we dried it, boiled it, and when we figured out what it was good for, what, what it could be used for. So those are the things that, those are the things that fascinated me. You know, when we talk about, talk about what we use plants for now. Plants, you know, some, there's a thistle plant that if you take the, the there's, there's a long thread at, at the, on the stalk. And if you separate that thread from the thistle stalk, you can take that thread and you can get, put several of them together and braid it and make a cord. And some of those thistle plants are like two, two feet long. So you, and each of those plants had several cords, maybe eight or nine cords on each stalk. So you'd pull off those cords and then roll them together and then you'd in, into, and then roll them into braids and then braid them together. So somebody had to figure that out to begin with. I, I watched my grandmother do that, harvest one of those thistle plants and, and um, it was a blue thistle. She used the, the, the flower part for medicine and then she made a cord out of the thistle plant. So I haven't seen much rose, many rose hips in my, in my lifetime. There weren't that many up, up there in, in, in South Dakota where I lived. I didn't see many, they were around. I saw a few, but, they're, they're, but you know, we left them alone pretty much. Uh, but they were there and that's uh, where probably the name of rosebud comes from, from the word Ujijitka, the rose hip. The rose, the red plant, the red the plant, not the flower rose, but the rose bud or, or the rosita. So that's where it comes from. But so somewhere in the beginning, our ancestors going back hundreds of thousands of years, some was out there in the forest, they're out there in the prairies, they're out, out, out there along the river, the mountains. And once they learned to write it down, of course not. They couldn't. They had no means to write it down. So how did this information? Uh, Dakshi, you're unmuted. Oh, there you go. Okay. One of the things that fascinates me is, is people's remember, ability to remember information, since that's what we're talking about. Um, when my mother was alive, I could call her because now today, you know, with, with our modern phones, we don't remember phone numbers anymore. We just look it up. But I could call my mother and say, do you remember my brother Harold's phone number? And she remembered it straight off the top of her head. So being able to remember something was also a learned skill. We don't do it so much anymore because we have the ability to look it up or read about it. And one of the things I would encourage you all to do is, is rely more and more on your memory as you go older, as you grow older, because that's, that, was, that was the key to our culture for so many, many generations. And, and we're, you know, we're getting away from that. So I'm glad you all are doing what you're doing by talking about certain aspects of the plant nation and what they're good for and how we, how we use them. So uh, I'm glad to be part of the program and, and uh, I'm anxious to learn more about what anybody else would know about rose hips. Um, uh, Wopida Dakshi, um, do you, have you, uh, and do you know, have you heard of, and do you know the story of, um, sometimes when I've been hearing and trying to learn about rose hips, people talk about Iktomi and the itchy butt berry <laughs> story. Do you, <laughs> the do one, you know that one? The one not, not so much, but the, but the, what, the way I heard it is that, he, you know, when he was hungry, Iktomi's always hungry. So he found these berries, these red berries. 
and he logically assumed that they were good to eat. So he started eating and chugging them down. But what he didn't know was that, you know, the little hairs on the berries, you have to remove those first. By the way, those hairs can be good for something. They, they can be used as an itch, itchy, itching powder. They can be used to cure itch. But because he ate everything, the whole thing, berries and hair and all, it gave him an itchy bottom when it was coming out the other end. So, you, you know, you gotta be careful. You gotta learn, <laughs> you gotta learn what plants are good for and, and what effects they have on us. So we don't wanna learn the hard way like Ekdomi did. Yeah, I always, um, it's so funny, last week, I now transitioned to working for another Native-led organization called Magizi that works with Native high schoolers that um, are going to school over in South Minneapolis, and we took them on a Dakota Sacred Sites tour with the folks here at Lower Failing Creek Project to Wakantipi and Indian Mounds, and then we also did a rosehip harvest, and we had um, uh, my Tui Fern Renville from Sistin come and she told that story of Ikdomi and the itchy butt berries <laughs> and all those kids they loved that story so much um, but then when we went out harvesting they were like oh, I don't even want to touch the, the real tips like I don't want to eat them I don't want to process them nothing because right. I'm not getting an itchy butt <laughs> and it was um, I just appreciate uh, you sharing these stories and um, talking to us tonight. I think that um, I really appreciate when you say just going out and doing, and that's how we learn. When we took our Wakayaja um, out last week, they all had such a wonderful time. And especially growing up in the city, we have all these medicines that are around us. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a lot of community members that are here and wanting to share those stories and um, Zoom makes it easier too. So Wopita for coming. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be part of it. Yeah, okay. So now we're gonna transition um, a little bit into our next two uh, sections of tonight's programming where we're gonna talk about Ujijintka who are rose hips and their medicinal gifts as well as their importance to um, the environment. So I'm going to share some more slides with us um, so we can transition into our next sections if everyone... Um, can bear with me. Um, so a little bit more about our presenters. Next, we have Rose Whipple, who is Santi uh, Dakota and Ho-Chunk, who's gonna be talking about rose hips and their um, medicinal gifts. And then after Rose, we'll be having Gabby Minoman talk um, about their um, ecological importance um, in that section. Um, Oh, I'm trying. So before we move on, though, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, Shauna Elk from Standing Rock, who is the Dakota artist for um, the graphics here for our Gifts of the Plant Nation program. When um, we wrote this grant for this program, which, by the way, this activity is made possible mm -hmm. by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Culture Heritage Fund. So we want to give a quick shout out to Jay Zhang and Fong He and other um, of our legislative representatives for making tonight's um, uh, program possible. But when we were writing the grant for this program, I really wanted to figure out a way where we can um, try to funnel a lot of the, the money that nonprofits have directly into the hands of our community uh, members, especially Dakota women. So I wanted to give a shout out to Shauna Elk, who, who drew these beautiful graphics for us. Gifts of the Plant Nation will be a seasonal program that we have that will highlight one plant relative per season. So this season, we're going to do rose hips. Um, in the winter time, we're going to talk about chanshasha. And um, in the springtime, we're going to have some elders and community members come and talk about nettles. And then we'll be talking about wachbe um, washtemina uh, or um, bergamot in the summertime. And so um, the this is what a rose hip looks like. I also have some that um, our youth harvested 
Um, we harvested uh, probably 40 rose hips and after processing them and taking the seeds out like Dexie Joseph Marshall um, told us about, this is about how, how much we got. <laughs> So the the rose hips they they look like this. Oh, mm -hmm. my screen's frozen. Uh, they look like this. Um, sometimes they can be a little bigger, and sometimes they can be a little smaller. But um, I'm gonna hand it off to my Mashke Rose, who's gonna talk a little bit more about um, their medicinal gifts. And one of the reasons too why we say gifts. Um, is because our, our plant relatives are as such their relatives and they have so many gifts to give us. And if we can acknowledge them as gifts, as plants that are that have spirit and are alive, our relationship to the environment really changes. And so that's one of the reasons we wanna host and do this program. And I am really excited to hear um, from Rose and Gabby. So I'm gonna hand it off to Rose. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, Hamatakiapi, Rose Whipple, Amakiapi, uh, Senti Hamataha. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Rose Whipple again. Um, thank you, Michelle, for helping to lead and host us tonight. Um, and so, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about some of those um, traditional medicinal uses and preparations of rose hips. And two, just before I begin, to kind of just want to talk about you know, for me, I grew up um, on the east side of St. Paul, you know, in the city, um, and I very much did not have access to green spaces or the outdoors, um, really until I was an adult and started doing this kind of work. Um, there just was nowhere near me that had plants or had medicines, um, and there was no one to teach me. And so I'm so excited to be here with you all. And also, you know, I'm learning with all of you guys, and I think that's what's exciting. Um, is doing this program with you all. I've been able to learn so much about rose hips and have been able to feel them and touch them and eat them. Um, and it has just been beautiful and really exciting for me as well. And so I'm excited for all of you guys to learn more about rose hips um, as I have. And so, yeah, so rose hips are just such an amazing um, medicine and something that um, I never really knew about growing up because rose hips, they have um, a very high concentration of vitamin C, and that can be really great for your immune system and has um, many, many other benefits, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit here as well. And so you can actually find um, wild, wild roses, where, which is what rose hips grow on, um, typically like in fields or um, on the edge of the road or trails. Uh, it kind of was crazy to me because you can actually find them almost anywhere if you're really looking, um, which I think is, is amazing. And so um, wild roses um, bloom in the spring and summer, but the best time to find rose hips is actually in early autumn or right now in the beginning of winter. Um, and so usually when we like to forage rose hips um, is usually after the first frost. Um, and that's because, you know, that, that, that first cold that, that hits um, in autumn really increases that natural sugar content um, that's in the rose hips. So that makes them taste really sweet, uh, makes them taste really good, which if you wait a little bit longer, um, they won't taste as good. So that's usually the time when we like to um, forage those, if that's something that you would like to do. And so again, yeah, rose hips um, actually taste super good. They kind of taste like an, uh, a mix of an apple or tomato or cranberry. Um, and so you can eat them raw or dried once the seeds are removed. And so just remembering that story, you know, of that, that itchy butt story, you know, make sure to, to just remove those seeds is um, pretty important. Um, and so um, a lot of people, they like to actually boil them down and make um, syrup or thicken them into a jam. Um, I've also seen people that had made muffins out of them. You know, you can make almost any um, anything out of rose hips and also add them to any recipe. Um, but for us, we really like rose hip tea. Um, I think it's what is most common when we hear about rose hips is tea. And so once they're dried up, um, you can grind them into a, a powder and actually combine them um, with wild mint. And that's um, a really great recipe for amazing tea. You can also find them in the store, just like in packets, um, if you don't want to go through that, you know, that hassle of having to find them and um, ground them as well. So it's pretty accessible, I feel like, in within stores. 
And so this was just, um, again, what Michelle was talking about. Some of our youth from McGizzy came over um, and got to harvest some of these rose hips and got to um, dry them and everything. And so that was very beautiful and really amazing to see. And so kind of just, um, you know, to talk a little bit more about that tea and all of the medicine that it provides, um, you know, really talking about how much of a gift that it is, um, you know, to have these rose hips and for them to be able to provide for us and for us to be able to also provide for them. Um, and so rose hips are actually super rich in antioxidants um, and antioxidants um, protect, protects against many, many chronic um, conditions like heart disease, cancer, and even type two um, diabetes, which is amazing to me because when you think about, you know, these illnesses um, and how much our people struggle with them and, you know, not having our people know that they can go outside and find, um, you know, um, rose hips and, you know, plants that can help them with that. And so that's super amazing. And also just how high the concentration of vitamin C is in rose hips is, you know, so amazing. Um, that really helps to support your immune system. And the, the fact that was the most craziest to me was that vitamin C um, in the rose hips is higher than in any other fruit or vegetable, um, which, you know, when you, when you consider how small rose hips are, you know, more than any other fruit, that's, it has a higher concentration of that vitamin C. Um, and in, in addition to that vitamin C, rose hips also contain high levels of vitamin A and E, um, which also have really help to protect your immune system. So, you know, when we're in a time of, you know, a pandemic, we have cold and flu season, you know, COVID going around, um, you know, consuming rose hips right now is um, vital, you know, to keeping ourselves safe and to keeping our immune systems up. Um, and they also really help to reduce inflammation and pain. Um, and so, you know, um, I've also seen that it can help with like arthritis or even pain in your body, um, you know, those kind of things. And so that's, that's really amazing to me as well. And so, yeah, I think I'll pass this over to Michelle to introduce our next presenter. Um, but thank you all for um, letting me speak with you all and letting me kind of share some of the knowledge that I've learned. Um, thank you. Uh, Wopita Rose, that was so, so great. or so lucky to have you to talk about these things. Um, uh, a few things about rose hips that I learned too is that rose hips are awesome when they're paired uh, with nettles, actually, because the vitamin C in rose hips makes the iron that you find in nettles a little bit more um, bioavailable to us humans. And um, the rose hips also kind of help to sweeten up nettle too. So when in the springtime, when nettles pop up and we do our webinar about nettles, um, and if you attend that one, keep rose hips in the back of your mind as a pair to go with um, nettle as well, because it's um, a really great medicine um, for us um, to use. And um, another thing that came to mind when we're talking about our, our medicines and learning more about our traditions is um, I was just thinking about when Dekshi said that word, midakuye awasi or dakuye um, oyasi, and how as Dakota people, we, we view our plant relatives as, as relatives. And when you do that, it's important for us to, to give our thanks. And so when we're talking about harvesting and foraging as Dakota people, it's our practice that we put our chashasha down and we say prayers before um, we take the lives of our plant relatives, really, because they have these gifts and they're, they're giving their lives to us so that we can stay healthy and get that vitamin C and be protected um, and supported through cold and flu season and, and just in general are able to continue these practices with our, our families and our friends. And I just wanted to, to share that real quick, no matter, learn the practices of your culture and, and how we relate to land. As Dakota people, it's important for us to lay our chashasha down, to say our prayers and to say our thanks before um, we accept these gifts. And I think each family has different practices and things that they have learned. 
I always kind of grew up um, hearing like never take more than what you need ever. Or sometimes I hear too, never take more than a third of what's there. Sometimes when we learn about new things, we get so excited and we can tend to over harvest. Um, and we really want to avoid that. So I think that that rule of never take more than you need or never take more than a third of what's there. I've even heard like count 13 and take one or count 10 and take one, but really just learn the, the practices of your people and how best to care for the land and the plants around us. Um, rose hips are so wonderful. Um, because you can find the hips right now um, after the first uh, the freeze that Rose talked about. But also, Rose is such a bountiful plant relative that uh, she gives us gifts almost all throughout the year. So um, harvesting for rose hip petals is really good for tea and making oxymels and, and tinctures if you're really into plant medicine making like that. Um, I love rose and it's such a good heart medicine too. You know, if you're feeling really down and really blue, I think that's why there's the saying of, you know, stop and smell the rose, the roses or the rose petals, because, um, rose hips are, are not only here for our immune system, but they're here for our spirit as well. And, um, they're just such an amazing relative with so many gifts. And I feel so lucky that we get to talk about them tonight. Um, I'm going to hand it off to uh, um, Gabby now to talk a little bit more about roses and rose hips and their benefits to the environment and um, how you can identify them and a bunch of good stuff. So Gabby, if you want to take it away, we would love to hear from you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabby Newman. Um, I come from the Forest County Hut. Forest County Potawatomi community up in Northern Wisconsin. Um, so um, very similar to Rose, I did not know much about rose hips um, until I actually moved to Minnesota just because rose plants don't really grow um, in our community very much. Um, they do grow because I did find one a couple summers ago, but they're just not super um, abundant um, from uh, where my community is from. But today I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, ecological benefits of um, wild roses and rose hips and also um, how you can identify the plant also to make it easier um, to harvest. So um, just some general information about roses. So um, Roses uh, come from the genus Rosa. There's about 150 different species within that genus um, and hundreds of different cultivars with, um, within it. Um, roses are part of the rosacea, rosacea family, which includes things like cherries, plums, strawberries, raspberries, um, lots of other different types of plants. Um, one fun fact about uh, roses is that um, in the genus Rose, Rosa, all the rose hips are actually edible and medicinal, which is, uh, I think is really special and a really fun uh, fact about them. So here in Minnesota, um, there are five different rose species that grow here. Four of them are native, the prickly wild rose, smooth wild rose, prairie rose, and uh, the woods wild rose. Um, there is one uh, rose species that is considered invasive from East Asia. This is the multi flora rose. Um, and here's just some pictures of what the roses uh, generally look like. So um, the color for roses uh, really uh, can vary. It can be uh, a really deep purple like the one you uh, you see you can see up in the upper right hand corner the prickly rose they can be a more pear, pale uh, pink color like the wood rose um, yeah so these are just some examples of the roses that grow here so identification um, so roses are actually pretty easy to identify especially once you see one uh, you're going to see them everywhere so um, when they're blooming, uh, it's pretty, they're pretty easy to distinguish. They have uh, five petals. Uh, they range um, 
They range in different shades of pink from um, a really pale pink to a more deeper pink. And um, yeah, as, as you can see in that picture there, um, the color of the petals can actually um, be very um, variable within the plant itself, um, the, the bush itself. It's not even just between the different species of it. Um, they can, they're very pretty versatile with their colors, but generally they're gonna be um, a pretty lighter shade of pink. Um, and then the rose hips, which are the fruit, uh, they're usually gonna be um, a red. Uh, sometimes they can be um, almost an orange, uh, orangey type red. Um, they can be uh, circular or they can be almost oval also. And let's see, the leaves, yes. So the leaves um, are going to, so the thing about roses um, is that they have compound leaves, which means one leaf has multiple leaflets on it. So if you look up in the upper right-hand corner at that um, diagram up there, um, one little leaf is called a leaflet, but the whole leaf itself is comprised of up to, um, what is it? around like seven or nine different leaflets. Um, and the leaves are gonna be, um, they're gonna be alternate from each other. So when they're on the stem, they're gonna be almost uh, staggered from each other. They're not gonna be right next to each other. They'll be more staggered like that. Um, the leaves are also uh, serrated or they have those little teeth on them. Um, and at the base of the leaf, um, there's, gonna, there's these things called stipules or they almost look like wings on them. So that's, um, the leaves are a really good way when the leaves are on the plant in the spring and summer. That's a really good way to identify the plant if you're not 100% sure based on um, the flower or if it's even flowering at that time. Um, so the wild roses that grow here, um, they're gonna be multi-stemmed. They're going to, uh, those stems are going to be woody also, and they're going to be, uh, generally, they're going to be red, um, red to brown. Um, some of them are going to have thorns, um, and some of them are not going to have thorns. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, give some uh, clarification for uh, how to identify a native rose from a um, the invasive multiflora rose, which is uh, sometimes found here in Minnesota. So this, uh, the invasive multiflora rose, it's gonna grow a lot larger. Um, the thickets are gonna be a lot larger and a lot denser than most of the native roses that grow here. Um, they're gonna have these really big curved thorns. Um, the flowers are gonna be white. Sometimes the flowers can have like a little hint of pink in them, but they're gonna tend to be white and they're gonna, the flowers are gonna cluster a lot more than um, the native rose uh, flowers will. Um, also, with the stipules or the, the wings at the base of the, uh, the leaf, they're going to, and you can see it in the picture here, they're going to be kind of fringed, whereas the native rose uh, species, the stipules are going to be um, fairly smooth. Um, and so, uh, like I mentioned before, um, the rose hips that come from this invasive uh, rose species, they, um, they are still edible. But the problem with them is that uh, they tend to overcrowd native species because they do grow in these super large, dense thickets. So um, that's just something to be a, on a lookout for, if, especially if you're going to be planting um, wild rose species. Um, just make sure that um, you're not adding to the problem of invasive species. So roses have a lot of really amazing ecological roles. Um, so they're, as um, Rose had mentioned er earlier, uh, they're usually found around forest edges, um, in fields, along roadsides and trails. They're also found, can be found in the woodlands. Um, oak savannas are a pretty common habitat to find them in, and prairies. Um, and they can also be found along uh, along streams and rivers in those riparian areas, uh, pastures as well. Um, so for pollinators, roses are really important um, uh, wildflower for pollinators. Um, unlike the roses that you would like maybe typically see in the, st in the store where the petals are really packed um, densely together, 
wild roses um, are open. So they're open and more available. The nectar and the pollen is more avail available for pollinators to come. So it's a really popular um, flower for um, bees and butterflies and other little insects and flies and wasps that come and pollinate as well. Um, let's see, so for wildlife, wildlife uses it in multiple different ways as food, shelter, and nesting. Um, so with the food, um, so um, small mammals, large mammals, um, and birds and insects are, um, they are gonna use a lot of, sorry, are gonna use these road hip, rose hips. Um, in the winter, um, the, is, one second. Sorry. <laughs> so in the winter, um, rose hips are a really important source of vitamin C as, has been mentioned before. Um, they also are pretty high in vitamin A and B. So they're really popular for, um, especially I've seen squirrels around here, around my neighborhood eating the rose hips um, once it's getting towards the end of the winter and food is becoming really, really scarce. The birds love them um, as well. Um, yeah, and so when I was reading into the uh, ecological importance of uh, rose hips for wildlife, um, I read that in the summer before the leaves fall off, the rose hips are actually super high in protein. So um, animals will use uh, rose hips as a source of protein too. Once the leaves fall off, the, uh, the level of protein kind of drops in the rose hips, but I mean, they're still pretty high in protein uh, throughout the winter. Um, they also, rose hips also have a lot of fatty acids in them which is pretty good for uh, dry skin as well. Um, let's see, and they also, rose hips can also help support a healthy gut flora, which um, also helps translate into a healthy immune system as well. Um, so other importances of wild rose, uh, they can be used as uh, soil stabilization. So, um, some of the native rose species, they uh, have these really, really thick uh, system root systems um, that can be uh, planted in uh, areas along waterways or where areas where there might be high erosion uh, because they help keep that soil um, in place and they help keep it together. Um, roses can also be used for uh, stormwater um, stormwater plantings because they because again, because of their dense root systems and they can, um, uh, let's see. Yep, they're just, uh, they're, um, they can be really helpful for um, in rain gardens also, but uh, you do have to be a little bit careful when you plant them in rain gardens because they can uh, overtake an area, um, but I mean, they're amazing plants nonetheless, so. Um, and there's actually, uh, related to uh, it kill me and the itchy butt, there is a reason why those little hairs on the seeds are um, might uh, give you an itchy butt if you were to eat them. So those little hairs are actually kind of a protective measure for when um, as uh, for when uh, animals or birds eat them. Um, it's just a way to help make sure that those seeds aren't staying in the animal's digestive system too long. Uh, because uh, rose hips do uh, partially rely on wildlife for seed dissemination. So it's just a um, fun little way that the plant helps protect its seeds to make sure that they get spread uh, without too much damage. So that's all I have for right now. Mm, thank you so much, Gabby. I loved learning about the the way that the seeds are protecting itself. And um, it's so funny. I, I I saw a meme the other day because when when flowers pollinate and open up, it's really, uh, okay, this is kind of funny. But the meme was uh, plants, okay, I'm just not even gonna tell it. It's a little inappropriate, but, <laughs> but I think that's so cool to learn about um, the seeds and how they want uh, to, to keep um, repopulating and how our animal relatives help in um, that sort of circle of life. 
Um, I just wanted to quickly go back to a few of these slides way in the beginning because I was thinking about how, you know, as, as Dakota people or just Native people in general, if you live around rose hips, um, this was from when we took a lot of the youth out to process the rose hips. And um, I so value when we're able to all get together and go do these things as a community, because as you can see from this plate um, that um, my friend Emelina is holding here, we probably spent about two hours removing all of these seeds that have those prickly tiny hairs on them. And I wanna say we processed, I don't know, I wanna say like around at least 40 to 50 rose hips that we gathered that day. And all of what you see on that plate is, is what the rose hips looked like after we had seeded them. So if you're ever buying rose hip tea or if you're gifted rose hip tea from relatives, it's a lot of work, um, but it is, it's such prayerful work too when we're all able to get together and remove those seeds. And when we're making medicine and sitting down with each other, um, we're putting our prayers into them as well. And that's what I love so much about our people is that when we're making medicine, it's not only us gathering and laughing and having a good time and putting our chanshasha down and honoring these relatives for the gifts that we're giving, but that medicine continues to grow as as we process them together as a community and pray for each other. Um, but I also wanted to show this picture on the left. I don't think that you can see it in here, but um, I think our people are so amazing because we translate all of the plants that we see in our, our environment into artwork. So rose, rose hips are in so many Dakota floral work, um, in beadwork and ledger work. And I just think that it's a, it's a really great full circle moment to see that um, we have these plants and plant medicines that are growing around us that we are taught about from our family members and our community members that we gather together and we make medicine, but we also take it a step further and we make beautiful art. Um, and I'm just feeling so grateful and inspired that we're hosting this webinar tonight. And a lot of us are, are young women that are um, doing these things. And it just, it makes my chante so full. Um, and I, I love that we can do this over Zoom so we can have um, our elders come in and speak. And I think right now we're gonna jump into the Q and A session. So if you have any questions um, for, for any of us or um, Dexy Joseph Marshall, um, I do have some that came in through Facebook Live. One question was, do you remove the seeds of the rose hips before grinding for a tea? Um, I think that the answer to that is yes, you want to remove those rose hips. I just showed the picture. Um, it's a couple slides back, so I won't do it again. <laughs> I won't do it again. But actually, I have my jar of rose hips that we all harvested together. And th this isn't um, ground down yet, but you can see that when you take the seeds out, um, the rose hips kind of look like this. And then what I would do now that they're dry is kind of grind them together um, so that it could, you know, formulate into a powder. And that's when you can take a teaspoon of the rose hips and combine it with the teaspoon of chaka or wild mint or really whatever tea that you want to have. Um, rose hips are really good um, to add them to. I know too, you know, if you're making your morning smoothies, uh, a teaspoon of rose hip powder in your smoothies can be really good or um, some people will even put them in their soups and stews just purely for um, the medicinal benefits that they have. Um, there was another question on Facebook Live. Um, oh, before I forget, you can also, if you don't want to go through the process of taking all the seeds out, you can make rosehip tea with just the... Um, just the the rose hips but you're gonna want to filter that through maybe two coffee filters and that's going to sort of break the 
or catch all those teeny tiny little hairs. So if you if you want to do that too, you can. If you if you don't want to take all the hairs out, you can make your tea um, or like get some uh, a small handful of rose hips, bunch them up in a coffee filter and put them, you know, in your in your hot water or make your tea and strain out your water um, through those coffee filters to get the teeny tiny hairs out of there. Um, there was another question about, do rose hips lose vitamin C when you dry it? Um, I think it depends on how you're going to dry your rose hips. So if you're going to try to dry your rose hips and say, um, I know some people will throw their rose hips in the oven on the lowest setting to dry them. Um, and I think sometimes that can deplete some of the vitamin C, but I don't think a lot. Um, I tend not to worry about that. One of my favorite ways to dry medicines in general is just putting them on a baking sheet and putting them in the dashboard of your car. Because when that sun comes through the window on the dashboard of your car, it, it dries your medicine so fast. And then you don't have to worry about, um, typically you don't have to worry about like that heat concentration getting so high where it's going to knock out the medicines that you're wanting to get from that plant relative. Um, so those are a couple of things that I've learned. Um, I'm going to see if there are any other can you also harvest the flower petals for tea? Yep. So that's one of my favorite teas is rosehip um, petal tea. I think I've never tried it, but like doing petals and rose hips together, that would be pretty good. Um, but rose petals are often, I think, um, a little more sweet than um, the rose hips. Um, Something that's really interesting that I learned not too long ago is, you know, for us, um, the word unjijintka um, also means tomato. And who is our word for, for hip or leg, I think. But I was just talking to some of my um, Anishinaabe friends and their, um, their word for rose hips is also related to their word for tomato. And I think it's, it reminds me of like the old debate of um, are tomatoes really a fruit or a vegetable, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> but I think it's so cool that both um, Dakota people, Lakota people, and Anishinaabe people, our words for rose hips um, are related to our words for tomatoes. Um, yeah, okay, some more questions coming in. Can you please share if you process seeds for any usages? I notice all the oils made from this plant relative is rosehip seed oil. That's a really great question. Um, I don't know a whole lot about that, but I know if you um, typically when uh, like beauty products, like rose oil for your face and, and stuff like that, it will take... Um, to make a lot of the beauty and skin products, um, they will take the the rose uh, hip seeds to make those those products. But um, you have to use a lot of seeds because um, I think I asked that question to um, my Tui Linda Black Elk a long time ago, maybe or maybe it was someone else. And in order to make the skin products and like oils and such, you have to use a lot and a very specific kind of rosehip seeds. Um, and that's why so many um, companies do that because they have farms of rosehips that they get those um, seeds from and process those seeds from. Um, I'm sorry, I wish I knew more about that. Um, okay, here we go, some more. Um, do you know anything about growing new rose plants from seed? Um, Gabby, do you do you know anything about that or could share anything about that? I do. So um, me and Rose actually a couple weeks ago, um, we processed um, some uh, rose hips that we got from uh, Dodge Nature, Nature Sanctuary here in uh, St. Paul. Um, and so it was really fun uh, processing that and adding it to a native uh, uh, native seed mixture that I made when uh, McGizzy came to visit us. So um, the process 
for um, processing the seeds. So um, when you take them out of the rose hip, you want to make sure that you get as much of the pulp off as possible. Um, after that, you want to dry it in the sun or dry it in a place where it's going to be able to dry um, fairly, fairly quickly. Um, if you plan on storing the seeds, uh, you want to make sure you put them in the fridge. Um, it just helps with, because um, in the wild, um, uh, the rose uh, the rose seeds uh, need, um, what's it called, some cold stratification uh, to be able to germinate in the spring. So uh, say you're harvesting the seeds while it's still warm out, uh, you wanna put them in the fridge for a little, uh, for a little bit. Um, I'm not sure about the time, maybe like a week or two uh, should be uh, fine. Um, but if you're harvesting them in the winter and you want to uh, throw them out in the winter, um, it's a perfect time. Um, and if you're gonna be throwing out seeds in the winter, you don't have to get as much of the pulp off as possible because as long as you get them uh, out there within a day or two, um, they're going to be perfectly fine uh, once the spring comes. So, yep, that's how I uh, process rose hips um, to uh, toss them out to grow in the wild. I'm so happy you're here, Gabby, and you knew the answer to that question. <laughs> um, we have another question here for Dexie Joseph. Um, and someone on Facebook Live is asking, do we use rose hips for ceremonies? Sometimes, yes. Yes, as, as something to drink, uh, as, as a tea. Awesome. And then another comment from Facebook said in Ojibwe, big rose hip is the word for tomato. So there you go. So I think that's really cool. Um, if there's any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, because we have one more really fun and exciting thing to share as we're sort of talking about how amazing Native women are. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing real quick so that I can share my screen again to show you how you can, um, support Shana Elk in our, um, okay, here. Okay, so share. Um, so from the grant that we got from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, like I talked about a little bit before, um, Shauna Elk from Standing Rock created the graphics for the Gifts of the Plant Nation program. And from that, we were able to um, create merch because that Lower Phelan Creek project, it's really important um, to us that we are supporting uh, Native women and Dakota artists. And so if, um, like I maybe mentioned before, Gifts of the Plant Nation is a um, a seasonal webinar where, where each season we're going to be highlighting one plant relative, bringing in elders and cultural knowledge keepers to share stories, and then Lower Failing Creek Project's team will be talking about their medicinal gifts as well as their importance to the environment and one way that you can support this program and all of the Native women that are involved is by buying some of this awesome merch. So um, there is this uh, really wonderful mug. I think I'm going to get like 30 of them uh, <laughs> as, as gifts for everybody as the holidays are coming up, right? Um, but as you can see, we're going to be releasing the merch as the different um, seasons uh, approach. So um, the Dakota name and the, the drawing for the plant relative will be on the back of um, the merch when the, the front will be the gifts of the plant nation. Um, so this is a great way to not only support a, um, a local native environmental organization that is working to protect our Dakota sacred site and take care of the environment here, but 50% of all the proceeds go to Shauna Elk um, and all of her work being an upcoming Dakota artist. Um, 
and there are cups and stickers and mugs and sweatshirts. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to, to share that too um, in ways that you can uh, support um, Native folks this holiday season and just in general. <laughs> um, Let's see, one other question here. Um, do you all ever notice black spots on strands of the fruit of the rose hips? Um, I notice on some fruits with this. Um, yes, that's a great question. When I first started harvesting um, rose hips and, and deepening my relationship with this relative, I remember um, seeing that, you know, some of them were this perfect um, round and plump red, fruit and then others were really black and they did not look so good but that doesn't actually tend to change their medicinal um qualities unless they're like completely black and decaying and they look like I don't know they're moldy or something but if there's a few black spots on them it is totally okay and healthy to harvest them and process them um I think that oftentimes we are so afraid um, and have been taught to be afraid of our plant medicines and um, reestablishing our connection to them more so um, than we are afraid of the, the groceries that we buy in the store that have all these chemicals on them. Um, but I just want to encourage everyone to not be afraid of our medicines that are that are around us and that those relationships really, they help us. They help our, our body and our mind and our spirits. I have had so many times where I have felt like I'm, I'm struggling, but, you know, going outside, there is, there is science to prove that it helps us. Um, and when we are able to connect with our relatives, we're not only healing ourselves, but we're helping to heal the land. And um, I think it's a really lovely thing that we can do. And I'm really proud to be a part um, or volunteer for Lower Failing Creek Project right now as they're um, doing this really amazing program. Um, yeah, so I just want to say Wopira Tanka, thank you so much to everybody that came out tonight to, to listen to all of us. And I want to say thank you again to Dexhi Joseph Marshall III for being here and sharing with us. And um, the webinar will be recorded. It's also currently being streamed on Facebook Live. So you will be able to go back and watch the webinar if you came in a little late. Um, and there should be closed captionings on the Facebook Live. And yeah, thank you so much everybody for coming. And I hope um, to see you all for the next three sessions. I'm going to say Dokshta and close it out. <laughs> I hope you all have a great night. If you're in Minnesota, drive safe. I know we have this snowstorm going on right now. And you should all be getting, if you registered, a follow up email from Lower Failing Creek Project with the link um, to the recording and, and all the good things like that. So I'm going to. Close it out.